Well, uh, welcome again uh, to the UIDG Systems Seminar. Uh, I'm happy to see this many people uh, again. So it's, uh, it's nice to have the show up. And, uh, for good reason, because we have a great presentation uh, today from uh, Dubai. Um, so this is uh, the first paper in our PhD, most likely. Uh, Dumbai is a PhD student at Vedak um, in our group with uh, Supervisor Pedro and also Maria. So uh, we can expect some different perspectives, both uh, from the energy side and maybe some finance aspects. Yes, but, um, so we have the presentation from Tony and the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, like, uh, I'm going to present uh, okay. uh, which is my first uh, paper for my PhD. Uh, so, uh, why do we have to study like TSO, TSO coordination and uh, active and user participation? Uh, so, yeah, as you know, that in a power system, there are quite a few state variables that are important. So, for example, voltage, uh, frequency, and phase angle, and current. and of all these variables, some of them uh, are like homogeneous uh, all around the power system, and some are like spatial uh, heterogeneous. Like it depends on where you are, and so for maybe for frequency control, uh, the entire power system has the same frequency. So yeah, everywhere is the same. But for the other like voltage, uh, phase angles, and the current, uh, you actually have like uh, spatial dependent uh, features. And so, yeah, under this uh, situation, uh, if you have uh, something that's uh, spatial homogeneous, then you can set up a, maybe a nationwide market and then uh, ask for the resource from anywhere and uh, it can help uh, uh, in the same uh, amount. But for uh, spatial uh, and then um, flexibility, and then you probably need to have to uh, look deeper into the physical constraint on the network, like how the voltage or current actually uh, would uh, like perform uh, if you if you dispatch different resources. Yeah. So, but uh, I mean, like power system already exists for maybe one to two century, so people already know how to control stuff about why is this more relevant topics because, of course, uh, from the supply side and demand side, since our tension, so from the supply side, you have more and more variable renewables and they are uh, very, they have variability and uncertainty, so it changes how uh, power flow and other state variables behave on the power system. And then, of course, on the demand side, you have more and more uh, unconventional demand, uh, like electric vehicles and also green hydrogen and other flexible loads that they might interact differently as conventional loads. Uh, loads. Yeah, so these will change how uh, the power power system will, will be, become in the future. Spatial, spatial flexibility, I mean, there's already conventional power plants, and in Norway, there's a lot of hydropower plants. So, why do we need like distributed resource and especially like end users resource? So, uh, first of all, from a technical perspective, most uh, distributed resources are inverter based, and they actually can have like faster and more accurate and also a wider range of controllability compared to conventional sources if they you manage them well. So it's actually a potential opportunity to harvest more flexibility. And then from economic side, uh, for a system perspective, maybe the transmission system operator or distributed system operator, they actually would like to have this uh, locally flexibility. So. Uh, in the paper my supervisor and my colleague uh, wrote before, like they actually calculate how much uh, the value of load sh shifting would have uh, for like uh, the transmission network in Germany. And I mean like in reality there are actually cases like in Germany when there's 
uh, not enough spatial flexibility due to like uh, insufficient network or uh, inflexible con conventional power plants. So, and then you need to redispatch, and the transmission system operator they actually would like the end users to like reduce their demand or yeah uh, accordingly to these situations so they actually really have an economic incentive to do that and then of course uh from the end user point of view because energy transition is not just a technical economic economic optimization problem so from end user point of view it's always better to let them have a source of uh participation, a sense of participation, either economically benefit or they feel like they actually help uh, keeping the grid uh, stable and keep the lights up. Yeah. Well, that is the motivation why uh, I would like to uh, co like consider how much uh, like end user participation in like TSO, DSO coordination would uh, benefit like from the system perspective and also from the perspective of end users, uh, particularly in Norway. Yeah. Oh yeah, so uh, that is why I developed develop a model for this TSO, DSO coordination like uh, with active end users. And so for the methodology then, yes, of course, uh, first I need to know like how much uh, electricity demand is going on in Norway and also what the like, yeah okay so like i say us uh, to to uh yeah to model the, the tso dso coordination i need to know like how much demand is on the in norway and also like what, what the network in norway actually is and yeah so the first thing is that uh well we have like uh electricity demand uh data for different uh the, the five bidding zones in norway uh like for every hour and yeah, but uh, like that spatial resolution would not be enough to actually calculate the, the redispatch situation in Norway. So uh, for the, the current version of the model, what I did is that I incorporate the population density uh, information of Norway. And then because that would be like a constraint, like uh, for each bidding zone, we know that the total amount of demand is that much and then we assume that the electricity demand is proportional to population density then you have five linear constraints for every hour and then you can try to find the probability density for for each uh, special point and then yeah it's a geostatistic inference problem and you can get like what the uh, per capita electricity demand would be uh, for each special point yeah, so that's uh, for the uh, electricity demand part. And then for the network part, uh, we also have like a uh, very like detailed uh, raw uh, data uh, for the uh, transmission and distribution power lines in Norway. Uh, so I split the data into two parts. So for the higher voltage part, like uh, 132 kilo, kilo volt or higher, uh, yeah, I try to uh, like uh, aggregate most of the nodes and nine into uh, the high voltage transmission network. And yeah, so that's probably 220 nodes uh, in this uh, transmission model. And then for the distribution network, uh, because there's like, I think 100,000 uh, power lines uh, in the raw data. So I try to find a way to uh, aggregate these data statistically. So what I observed is that for the distribution line, uh, there's a power law between the line lens and the the, the amount of the lines. Yeah, so there's like a power law in, in that. And then so uh, with that statistical knowledge, uh, I try to model the distribution network by this power law. So if we know that uh, for, for every uh, one, one kilometer 
or, or longer, then you have less power lines, then you can model distribution network like that for, for each uh, spatial uh, spatial uh, <laughs> a grid in, that, in, in this case. And then, yeah, so, so then you can get a distribution network. Yeah, and so if you actually do the math and uh, look into the limiting case of this grid, uh, it's actually like a, a fractional Laplacian operator. Yeah, but it's just uh, yeah some, something that's uh, interesting that uh, I, I found out during, during the modeling of this uh, network. Yeah, and then so that is for the like the network and the, uh, the demand field part. So that that is more like uh, input data that that uh, is like something that's constant over the model and then for the operational period then yeah the market has to like uh, you know, there's I, I have to also like set up a scheme for the market and also how and end user actually interact in this model yeah so for the TSO DSO coordination there are a lot of proposal right now going on like how is the best way to do things and in my model uh, I choose uh, like a centralized uh, way of doing things uh, because that's the something that's more uh, like it's more convenient in the sense that uh, it doesn't change that much uh, when compared to the current uh, current uh, market market skin. Yeah. So then we have like maybe a business as usual scenario that is that uh, like end users and power plants <clears> they when they submit their bid they, then you have an clearing on the energy only market which is like the node pool and so so it's basically a continental wide uh, market clearing and then yeah in this market clearing of course the there's a market operator that performs like a optimization problem that maximize the social welfare according to the bit information. And then once that is done, then the TSO in Norway does the redispatch. So yeah, uh, that would like minimize the redispatch cost and also like in, uh, that un also honors the, the physical constraints. Yeah, so that is for like a business as usual scenario. And for the second scenario, uh, then what I propose is that so everything stays the same as much as possible, but during so after the market clearing of the energy only market and before the TSO does the physical uh, constraint and the redispatch problem, uh, the distribution system operators of each each distribution network. Uh, would first uh, filter the the bits that is like redispatchable uh, within its own like uh, distribution system, and so that is like uh, something that that the DSO would do. And then, so if this bit uh, would, if if it is redispatched, it if there is a potential that it might affect the how the distribution system network. Uh, Operate then the DSO says would reject this redispatchable bit, so the TSO would not activate it, uh, like would not put that into its calculation for for the redispatch problem. Yeah, so that is the scenario two, and in this scenario, the end users do not does do not uh, provide the redispatch redispatchable bits. Yeah, so for the third third one is that. The, the third scenario would be that the, the end users they they would participate. Uh, well, some of them, the active end users, the active ones, they would participate, redispatch uh, during the the process. So they would join the the redispatchable bits, and then the, when the DSO filter the bits, they would also consider these active end users. Yeah. So uh, what do I mean by active end users? So I like uh, differentiate three types of end users in this model. So one is the inflexible end users. They 
uh, they have the electricity demand as like the what uh, I calculate in the spatial field uh, estimation. And there's the ordinary flexible end users like they 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 have batteries and electric vehicles, but they don't participate in the TSO DSO coordination. And then there's the active flexible end users, which they participate in the TSO DSO coordination. So yeah, I, the, the the second and the third uh, type uh, I differentiate them because I want to know uh, what the incentive actually are for end users to be active and not just mind their own business with their batteries and electric vehicles. Yeah. And then for the last part, and uh, because I want to know the incentive, so I need to know like how much uh, price the end user has to pay and how does it change uh, if they actually join the redispatch uh, in the TSO DSO coordination. So yeah, first there's the settlement in the energy only market, so the end user has to pay electricity price. And well, if they have the battery discharge, they might receive some uh, uh, revenue for that. And then for the redispatch, then if they if their uh, demand is redispatched, then they don't need to pay the price, and uh, they might have some compensation for redispatch, and then they have to pay the redispatch price also. Yeah. So for the last part is the results and analysis. So. I haven't like completely uh, finished all the analysis, uh, but uh, I will show what uh, I've done so far. Uh, so for the price on the energy only market, uh, so I run the simulation for two weeks. Uh, one week is the first week of January and uh, the other is the first week of July. So it's like a seasonal comparison between winter and summer. And then, yeah, so, so as you can see, the, in, in, in winter, the energy, uh, the energy only market clearing prices are higher uh, than in uh, summer as expected because we have higher demand in uh, winter. It's about like 10 euros per megawatt hour in, in this model. Yeah. And then for the, for the, uh, the, the actual network uh, situation, so here I plot what happen on average in the transmission uh, network. So uh, as you can see, so for the places where higher population density, the cities in the south and in central Norway, you on average, there is more uh, electricity demand and higher uh, like power power demand that 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 they need to draw from the power network. And, and then for the mountain area where there is a lot of hydro reservoir it's usually on average a uh, power power source uh, so so where the power uh, comes uh, into the power network and yeah so in, in the winter you can see that the 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 power uh, imbalance situation is more stress uh, especially in southern Norway so there's more uh, util utilization rate in the transmission lines uh, in in the winter and there's more like imbalance between supply and demand. Yeah. So in the summer, in summer, then that that situation is less tense. Yeah. And then so for the uh, compar comparison of the three scenarios I mentioned. So right now uh, I calculate how much uh, costs uh, are in the three scenarios. And as you can see that for the summer we get what we expected. So uh, the average cost is lower. Like I mean like for for the if 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 the if there's redispatch then some of the demand are curtailed. Either it's like industrial flexible demand or some some of the end user demand are curtailed. Mm -hmm. So so the cost would go down. Yeah, but if there's active end users participate then it go down further a little bit. Yeah. And then, but for for the summer right now, uh, I actually f find out that if you put active end users in it, uh, the the total cost and the average cost actually increase. So I, I thought it might be that uh, I did something wrong with the price prediction because if the active end user wants to provide like batteries in the in the model, they 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 need to 
have some guess in what the future prices would be, and then they they would bid accordingly to that uh, for their battery. So so I changed some some of the the sensitivity around this price prediction, uh, but uh, the results are uh, similar. Like if you put active land user in somewhere, the the average cost actually actually be, uh, becomes higher. Uh, so what I think right now uh, possibly explain this is that uh, because there's no uh, intertemporal optimization in this like model, like the, the market operator get the bits and then it optimize the social welfare according to the bits in that time interval and it doesn't care like what will happen in the next time interval. And also for the TSO, when they do redispatch, they also, uh, in, in my model, it doesn't take into account this intertemporal, yeah, independent uh, interdependency. So it might affect how actually the optimal like battery storage uh, schedule would be. Yeah. And then so for the the end user side, so how they actually what incentive they actually get. Uh, so this is like a population density weighted median of how what the average electricity prices would be for different types of end users in a in a third scenario. So when when you have the active uh, flexible end users, and so again there are some results that is as expected. Like uh, the active end users, they actually. Uh, can reduce their uh, redispatch price, and they they actually have a lower uh, average cost, uh, uh, average price of electricity, and then yeah. But for like uh, some some bidding zones in some seasons, that doesn't seem to hold true. Yeah. So yeah, I'm thinking because uh, when I was setting the model, uh, I did not consider. The compensation for uh, reduced supply and demand. Because uh, if I did that, then uh, the redispatch cost would uh, skyrocket. Uh, yeah, because if you have a willingness to pay off a demand for like 3,000 euros per megawatt hour, then the redispatch cost would be uh, very high. So, so yeah, that that's why I, I did not take into account this compensation. But then, yeah. That that might affect how uh, the active flexible end users uh, would get on this uh, in, in this model. Yeah, so that's uh, currently the uh, situation for my uh, uh, model. Yeah, and yeah, so that's what I have done so far. Yeah. So that's basically most of it. <laughs> yeah.